Uh, we're stepping out of the This Is Us series, uh, preparing for the Imperfect series, and today is a standalone message. I believe this message to be an important one. Um, I know as I prepared for this message, I'll be honest, I prepared this message uh, and preached it at another church a few weeks ago um, because they asked me to speak on it in this specific text. Um, but um, 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. Go ahead and turn there. Today's topic is simply this, a Christian's relationship to authority. A Christian's relationship to authority. If there ever were a topic that would be important for us today in the climate in which we exist in 2020, I believe this to be a relevant topic today. I believe the text today to be a relevant text. And by the way, I believe every text that we open up on Sunday, every single text that we open is relevant for today. Granted, there may be some text that we may have to dig a little deeper uh, to find and understand and comprehend and interpret and then apply, but every single text uh, is relevant for today. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, if you don't have it there, it'll be on your screen. On the screen here, 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 11 says this, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works which they observe glorify God in the day of visitation. If that sounds like the book of James, it's very close. We'll get there in a minute. Therefore, and we only spent 19 weeks at James, so, you know, we're good. Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to governors as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. By the way, there are a few select times in Scripture where the Bible says, this is the will of God. There are a few times, and when it says that, we should pay attention, okay? So, verse 15, for this is the will of God, that by doing good, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free, yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bond servants of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, Honor the king. This is an extremely relevant topic. In the second week of March, everything changed, right? You guys remember, think back. I remember that Sunday well. I remember that Sarah and Aaron were uh, getting the kids areas ready for their next second Sunday and, and, uh, in March. And we had kind of that week, we were like, we heard about this thing called coronavirus. We didn't yet, I didn't yet know the difference between coronavirus and COVID-19 because I'm, you know, I'm not the most intelligent guy on the block the second week of March about this stuff. I didn't study that in my global pandemics class. So, um, so we weren't really sure, but we're like, hey, we're just gonna throw some extra hand sanitizers out and like, everybody will be good. We went to a men's conference, I think, that Friday and Saturday. And man, we had, there were like 300 men jam packed in this auditorium. I mean, everybody would have gone crazy. It, it was like we were having a peaceful protest. I'm just kidding. Um, but, uh, but we're all there. We didn't know what was going on. We had no idea. But from the second week in March until now, we've gone through something that I've never been through in my life, and very few people have. Nobody living has gone through uh, what, we went, what we've been through. And i got to be honest with you. I think we've all, in our own ways, we've struggled through this pandemic. Uh, some people may have struggled more than others. Uh, some people may have just hidden their struggles a little bit better than others. But I think we've all struggled through this. What is appropriate and what is not appropriate? Uh, whose data can I trust? When I, when I turn on the news, uh, one person says this, and then I turn over to another network and they're saying this. Who can I trust? And while I'm not here today to answer those questions for you, I know this, 
my personal life rhythm got messed up. My family's personal life rhythm got messed up. And things are just different. Different. Our children went from uh, sociable uh, environments, my two children, at their school, at their large public school where they have more people there than they would ever be able to be friends with to sitting in front of a computer with headphones on asking if they can stay to hang out for 15 minutes with their friends online. It's just different. It's just different. In case you're wondering, people have a wide variety of opinions. Some of us need to get off of social media, don't we? And I'll be honest with you, when regulations are handed down from the state, as you well know, we are doing our best to comply with those. As you know, when you come in here, uh, we're doing our best to stay safe, continue with every other row seating. Uh, your temperature was checked on the way in. There's hand sanitizer stations everywhere you can turn. And we're doing our best to comply. At one time in Durham, they said no more than five people could gather together. Many other places in North Carolina, it was 10. And currently in states like California, churches, I believe, are being singled out and, uh, and, and, and targeted uh, due to this, told they cannot sing, uh, a church in Northern California uh, fined $52,000 in just over a week for meeting and for trying to open up a, a, a Christian school that they've had for 30 years. In case you were wondering, people have a wide variety of opinions on this. So I ask you this morning to think through this question. What should a Christian's conduct be towards authority. Let me ask it a little bit more specifically. What should a Christian's conduct be towards civil authority? I think it's a valid question. Just in case COVID-19 was not enough, the murder of George Floyd and the Kenosha, Wisconsin and the Louisville, Kentucky and all the mess that comes along with it threw itself into the mix just because we weren't quite confused enough and we weren't quite in a tizzy enough. And guess what? You bet it. People have a wide variety of opinions on this. I, I set up the sermon today by saying that because I want us to understand that we as Christians should look to Scripture during times like this to, to tell us and instruct us on how we are supposed to live and how we are supposed to act. And I believe this morning, if you're here, don't leave. Give me the whole sermon. If you're online, I know you just came online to watch our music. That's what people do. I'm not going to lie. I do the same thing. All right. But, uh, but I know you were just here for the music, but if you're still here online, stay for the whole thing, please. I believe scripture helps us this morning. You say, Josh, are you going to tell me what I need to believe about COVID-19? Absolutely not. Are you going to tell me what I ought to believe about the, the shootings and what? I, I, the Lord knows I'm not. That's not my job. But I believe taking those things in consideration in our current climate and environment that we are living in, I believe that this passage of scripture and this text this morning is extremely important for us to know how we are to uh, act and have a relationship with authority in our lives. What about when authority seems to be wrong? How do we draw the line between obeying God rather than obeying man? I hope, as Christians, sometime over the last five and a half, six months, I hope that these questions have kind of come up in our minds. Because I think these are healthy questions that we must ask. Let's look back in our text this morning and see what Peter has for us. Number one, I want us to see this. A commitment to good works. A commitment to good works. How can we have a proper view of authority? 
How can we uh, have a good relationship with civil authorities and other authorities in our life? Number one, a commitment to good works. Look at verse 11. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war, which war against the soul having your conduct honorable among the gentiles that when they speak against you as evildoers they may by your good works which they observe glorify god in the day of visitation i'm not this won't pop up on the screen but verse 15 was this is the will of god that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men if we're going to even begin walking down the road of having the proper relationship to authorities, civil authorities and other authorities in our life this morning, a church, followers of Jesus, we must be committed ourselves to godly and biblical living. We must be committed ourselves to godly and biblical living, to good works, to good works this morning. Our church, we just finished up 19 weeks, I mentioned in the book of James, and that entire book, Helps us to grasp what a real faith looks like. And real faith looks like good works. You remember? Faith vertically, theologically, our standing in Christ is, is in Christ alone, by grace alone, through faith alone. And then it's acted out horizontally in good works, by grace alone, through faith alone. But it's visible. It's seen by other people. We're justified by, uh, in the sight of God by grace, through faith we're justified in the sight of men by the good works that that grace and that faith produces. We've studied that as a church, and I hope that that's been ingrained in us, and I hope we understand that. But James uses strong language in James chapter 1 and verse 22. It says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Being doers of the word. How about... Chapter 2 and verse 17. Thus also faith by itself, if, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. How about Matthew chapter 5, in case James didn't help you. How about Matthew chapter 5, uh, Jesus speaking on the Sermon on the Mount, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father. Which is, then we see your good works and glorify your Father. You see, that verse right there tells us that we can do good works for the right reasons and we can do good works for the wrong reasons. That we can do good works so that they see us and we are magnified or that we may do good works and they may glorify our Father, which is in heaven. This morning, if we're going to have the right kind of relationship with civil authorities around us, we must commit ourselves to righteous living and to good works. May I say this? If we think that we're ever going to be in a proper position to be able to decipher uh, when it's a right to obey God and when it's right to obey man, whenever those roads cross, if we think we're going to be in a right position to do that, we must be living godly and righteous lives to begin with don't even start to think about subverting civil authority if you're not living a life worthy of being called a follower of christ don't think you're in any kind of a mindset to step into civil disobedience this morning if you're not following jesus with your life you're not committed to him you're not living a life of good works produced by grace and through faith secondly this morning i want us to see this first we had a commitment to good works, but secondly, I want us to see this, a commitment to submitted living. A commitment to submitted living. Look at verse 13 in our text. Therefore submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to governors, as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. Parents, we, we love the concept of submission when we're talking about our kids. Those of us that have kids currently, those of you that have had kids and are now older, or maybe those who have yet to have kids, let me break it down for you. 
as parents, we love to say things like, listen, you're, I know you don't understand it, but you just need to submit. I know that your flesh wants to fight, but you just need to, you need to submit, right? Just, just trust me as your parents. I know what's best. You don't need to go the wrong way down the road in your car. You're going to get hit. You don't need to cross I-40 at 545 on Friday afternoon on foot. You just don't need to do it. I know you want to do it for some reason, but you don't need to do it. You need to submit. And we love as parents, boy, we love that word submit. We love that word. But what about for us? Hey, what about for us as adults? Romans chapter 13, by the way, is a... Is, a, is a another text in Scripture that deals with our relationships with authority. I'm not here today to break down that entire text. I will say that uh, it does need to be broken down and it does need to be properly uh, presented. But the first two verses simply say this. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. Now, there's a lot to unpack in those two verses and the, the, the following verses after that. I'm not here today to tell you everything I believe about these verses. I am here telling you this today, that authority is appointed by God. And that's why authority should be respected. That's why authority should be prayed for. That's why authorities in our life, whether we agree with them or we disagree with them, there should be a level of respect and honor that is due to those in authority. Now, this is not a political statement here today. It kind of rubs me the wrong way. And I'll say this over the last three presidents, when we just refer to our presidents by their last name. That just rubs me the wrong way. I don't care who the president is. It just kind of rubs me the wrong way. Whether we are for or against, I believe there just should be a level of submission to the authorities that God has appointed in our lives. I believe they're worthy of our prayers. Well, I didn't vote for him or her or whatever. That's fine. The Bible didn't say that all authority you voted for was appointed by God. It said all authority is. And so, so I believe our leaders and our civil leaders should be, should be prayed for. Have we even thought about that? Imagine what they're going through, but praying for them. Scripture is clear. Followers of Jesus should be obedient citizens of the land. We should seek to obey civil ordinances and laws. We should live in submission and be good citizens. Why? Correct? Why? Because that's the question I ask as a rebellious kid, right? Why? You know why? Verse 13 tells us, for the Lord's sake. Why should we live in submission to the authorities in our lives, for the Lord's sake, for our testimony's sake, for the gospel's sake, because people are looking at us and knowing that we're followers of Jesus, and we're supposed to be hidden behind that cross, and we ought to live in submission to authority for the Lord's sake, because we bear the name Christian, Christ-like. I'm not going to get on it this morning because I want to practice what I preach but I believe we ought to do our best, even on speed limits. Come on, Lynn, let me hear it. On speed limits, we ought to do our best. Uh, we only got one officer in here. Oh, we got two? Where's Dave? Oh, man, come on. We got two officers in the building today. I'm going to get some amens from them. But we ought to do our best when we, you know, unless we're running late. I'm just kidding. Uh, but we ought to do our best to live within the bounds of the laws of our land. We ought to do our best. And listen, when we don't, we ought to own it. We ought to own it. This morning, I'm here to tell you that we ought to live submitted lives. And if, we'll be, if we will live submitted lives, number one, to live godly, then I believe we will live submitted lives in the areas in which our authorities in our life, civil authorities and other authorities in our life, tell us to. We will live our lives in submission to the structures that God has placed in our lives. I believe that's clearly what is being taught in this text. And so I ask myself and I ask you, is your life and personality marked by a willingness to submit? 
a willingness to submit? Or do we live our lives like MMA fighters? We have some MMA fans in here, I believe. Do we live our lives like MMA fighters? And man, that guy's trying to get you in an arm bar and you're doing everything you can to not be submitted, right? And if we're not careful as Christians, we live our lives like MMA fighters. And every time everybody tries to make us submit, we, we fight against it. And every time, we, no, we fight against it. Christian, there's, there's no way to live. Believer, that's no way to live for the Lord's sake. That's no way to live for our testimony's sake. That's no way to live for the gospel's sake because whether we like it or not, we now bear the name of Jesus Christ as one of his followers. And our submission to the laws of the land should reflect his love, his grace, and his truth. So this morning, we ought to have a commitment to good works. Before we ever consider our obedience to civil liberties or to, to civil laws, we ought to ourselves do good works. We ought to be characterized, secondly, by those who live in submission. Hey, listen, you ask me to stay off the shoulder of the road, okay? Well, you know what? Even though there's traffic and even though my exit's right up there, you know what? Don't tell on me. Um, Sarah, um, I'm going to wait. Hey, listen, you, you, okay, can I get real? You say that we should keep social distancing and that we should, when I go to Harris Teeter, that I should wear a mask. This is just me. Okay. I hate it. Listen, I'm fat, and I lose my breath, just being for real. And when I'm fat and I lose my breath and I got a mask on, it's like, man, I get to like the second aisle, and I'm like, like I got to get my breath real quick. I'm about to head over to the meat, and we know where that goes. I'm about to buy me some steak, and this ain't good. I don't like it, but you know what? It's private on business. Hey, if we're... We're like, it's all good. If we're going to fight for the right of a baker to refuse to bake a cake for a couple that they don't want to bake a cake for because they're a privately owned business, are we there? Everybody know what we're talking about? Then we ought to also submit to other privately owned businesses who say you have to wear a mask to come in. We can't fight for the liberty of one and, br- and buck against the liberty of the other. That is not in my notes, but that's okay. Lastly, A commitment to godly relationships. A commitment to godly relationships. We've already spoken about verse 15, but I'll read it here. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. As free, yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bondservants of God. And I'm not going to touch much on that verse, but I love that verse, by the way. Tim speaks to Tim's message a little bit last week. Verse 17, honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. What a rich three verses. We should be concerned with our relationships with brothers in Christ, with the unsaved, with civil authorities, but ultimately with God Almighty. We ought to be concerned that we're having biblical relationships to our brothers and sisters in Christ, to the unsaved, towards civil authorities, and ultimately with God Almighty. We should seek for each of these relationship paradigms to be biblical and to be godly. And I believe Peter helps us here in the final verse of our text, in verse 17. I believe he helps us to understand a word that we must truly grasp If we are to answer the question, how should a Christian act and what should our relationship be toward authority? That word is balance. I actually think it's one of the most underrated words in the Christian life. The word is balance. You say, what do you mean? Look back at verse 17. Honor all people. Saved, unsaved, doesn't matter. Give them honor, respect. Show them the dignity that they deserve. Love the brotherhood. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples. If you have love, one for another. Love the brotherhood. Love your brothers and your sisters in Christ. 
Fear God first, but honor the king second. Isn't that beautiful balance? Just think about that verse. Listen, we, we, should, we should honor all people. There should be respect and there should be mutual dignity given and we should not look down our nose on anyone. We ought to honor them and respect them. My daughters know this. I tell them all the time. They can help me in the sermon right now. When you're speaking to each other, you need to speak to each other with, with, man, look at them, kindness and respect. Kindness and respect. That's for everyone, but love the brotherhood. Love the brothers and sisters in Christ. Hey, love them. Fear God and honor the king. Honor the king. So to answer this question about how our conduct should be towards authority, allow me to sum it up in these three closing statements. We should commit ourselves to doing good no matter the circumstances. Hey, listen, before we even start, before we even have the conversation, we should commit ourselves to living a life of righteousness. We should commit ourselves to being legitimate, authentic followers of Jesus Christ. And secondly, we should humble ourselves and submit to civil ordinances because we have a reputation as a follower of Jesus. Take that for what it's worth. We have a, we have a reputation for the Lord's sake. But third, thirdly, to sum it up this morning, we should fear God first and then honor the king. We should fear God and then honor the king. I want to read today because I want to make sure that I'm being accurate to what God laid on my heart. Anything that does not allow us to fear God first is an area where we can consider a biblical step into civil disobedience. I'll repeat that so that it's abundantly clear. Anything that does not allow us to fear God first is an area where we can consider a biblical step into civil disobedience. But those are few and far between. Few and far between. The New Testament gives us plenty of examples of the apostles being given government orders to not preach. And you know what they did? They preached. And you know what happened? They got arrested. You know what they did when they went to jail? They sang praises and prayed and preached. And they let them out. And guess what they went back to doing? Preaching again. So the New Testament gives us scenarios where we can biblically and lovingly and God and in, in, in the spirit of, of Christ step into those times. But those are few and far between. I must say that I do believe that our civil uh, leaders from the federal, state, and local levels uh, during these last six months have kind of walked a fine line. I must be honest. I believe they've walked a fine line in our state. However, I believe everything has been fair. The fact that bars can still not open at all means, in my opinion, the church has not suffered persecution in the state of North Carolina. Just being honest with you. The fact that movie theaters can still not open, but we can sit in here today, means that the church in the state of North Carolina has not faced persecution. I want to be very clear on that. However, if we take a step back and we look at what is happening in our country, in certain pockets of our country, there are people getting fined today. In fact, right now it's 7.57 a.m. in California. There will be churches today who meet, who write a $5,000 check just to meet today and worship together. You say, Josh, if they came in North Carolina and said you cannot worship together, it'll be $5,000. Those churches out there are pretty big. It's actually probably a financial decision on their part. Like we're going to bring in a lot more than $5,000 in our offering today, so... We're still going to meet. For us, we'd meet. We'd also start a GoFundMe. And maybe we could fund uh, renovating this building uh, by doing so. 
Listen, I've come to grips with this, folks. With all of our health in mind, with everything. Listen, if God forbid, if, if COVID were to outbreak and it affect our church family, I have come to the point with this. We may tell you all to stay home because that's what we, we would, that's what we would do. But somebody who is free of the virus will stand here every Sunday and will preach. I've just come to grips with that. I've just come to grips with that. You say, why? Because I believe that the church of the living God is a called out assembly of believers. I believe this morning that God's mandate from Scripture supersedes any mandate that could come down from our government. You say, Josh, are you being crazy about our health? No, 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 no. I'm not being crazy about your health. I promise you. I think you know. I think we're establishing a track record. <clears throat> but I will say this. If I were in California today, by God's grace, I truly believe I would stand behind my pulpit and I truly believe I'd preach God's word. Remember, Righteous living, good works. A submitted spirit. Making sure our relationships are right with God first and then the king. And let's be honest. 99.99% of the time, there is no, there is no situation there. 99.99% of the time, we're just doing exactly what we feel God would have us to do and exactly what our civil authorities would tell us to do. And our relationship should be in submission to them. I think, I don't, I don't know if they record every instance of uh, reaching out. I've reached out to our governor's office, I mean, our, our mayor's office and spoken with his assistant on numerous occasions. And I just expressed, hey, listen, we wanted to just make sure, we wanted to clarify a couple of things. This was back earlier on. We wanted to clarify and get some clarification on what the Durham City Ordinance were. This was even while we were pre-recording our messages. We wanted to make sure, even in our pre-recording, not even a public service, we wanted to make sure that we were fine. If y'all, some of the band remembers, we had to like invite certain people to come and we couldn't invite everybody in the whole worship team because we had to keep our numbers right. Just the way it was. Tim remembers, we had to go through and select, like who can we even ask? We will follow, but at the end of the day, God's word reigns supreme. Whatever your opinion is about your civil authorities right now is your business, but I know this, God has called you to live righteously, and God has called you to live in submission to authorities, and I'm convinced that if we will live righteously in this world and we have a spirit of submission, if the day ever comes where they're said, they say you cannot open your doors, that the church will thrive in a house, that the church will thrive underground like it's been thriving in Asia for years, that the church will thrive as it is thriving in the fastest growing Christian nation in the world. You know what it is? Iran. That the church will thrive. You say, Josh, you're trying to scare me. No, I, I'm not trying to scare you. I'm trying to be serious because I do feel like in the last 15, let's just be honest, post 9-11, we live in a different world. We live in a different country. And I do feel that we must biblically walk through situations that we could face as believers in Jesus. Parents, if I may, in closing, may we take the word submission as seriously in our Christian lives as we want our children to take it in, our, in their obedience to us. May I ask a church that we be a church that follows civil guidelines and ordinances. Look, man, I don't, I don't like it. 
But I, I made a decision at the very beginning, and, and my, with my wife's help, to be honest with you, because in my flesh, I'm a rebel. Got to be real. <clears throat> with my wife's help, I, I came to grips very early on with, hey, listen, if that's what they ask us to do, okay. Balancing that, I do think there's a line. I do not believe our state has crossed the line. I do not believe our city has crossed the line. But I believe in some areas of our country, the line is at the very least being bumped. And I just want us to be biblical this morning. Why? As we close, for the Lord's sake. For the gospel's sake, because Jesus came and lived his perfect life here on this earth. By the way, he lived a perfect life and often got in trouble with political leaders of the day. Just keep that in mind. He lived a perfect life, but he came and lived a perfect life. He died the sinner's death, your death, my death. He hung up on a, on, on a, on a cross, not nearly as beautiful as that one. Beaten to where he could not even be recognized as a man. Bled and shed his blood. Was buried in a borrowed tomb. Three days later, he rose. He rose in victory and triumph over sin, over death, over hell. Why should we live in obedience? For his sake. Because we bear his name. Because we're followers of him. This morning, if you're not a follower of him, Today, we didn't talk about our political views. Today, I didn't give you my opinion on any of the current events other than my flesh. Didn't give you my opinion on any of the current events today. But I hope today we leave and we think about for the Lord's sake. If you've never follow Jesus, and you can't say you're living this and doing this for his sake, I want to invite you today. If you're watching online, if you're here, Jesus Christ loves you so much that he died for you. That is so much bigger than anything our country is facing right now. That's so much bigger than the election that's coming up in a few weeks. That's so much bigger than anything else. You you know what's huge? Jesus Christ loves you and died for you for you and he wants to be your savior he wants to take what's old and make it new he wants to take what's dead and make it alive he wants to make a new creation in you he wants to give you an eternity in a place called heaven and i got to be honest if you die in your sin your eternity is in a place called hell you say i don't know much about those places look them up Jesus Christ made a way. He is the answer. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the door. If it needs to come in, they must come through that door. This morning, if you've never submitted yourself to Jesus Christ as your Savior, I want to beg you today.